After the GOP has just concluded their raucous debate, I figured it would be a good time to reflect on the first ever broadcasted presidential debate. And no, that's not the 1960 election debate on television featuring John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. We're talking 1948, the great Oregon radio debate where the governor of Minnesota, Harold Stassen, and former hard-charging district attorney Thomas Dewey were duking it out for the Republican nomination and the right to challenge President Harry Truman. Safe in the White House till early 1949 is Harry Truman, the ex-haberdasher from Missouri. His position at home has been greatly strengthened by his firm handling of domestic problems. 1948 seemed like a ripe year to challenge incumbent President Harry Truman. For the last six months, Truman popularity consistently fell below 40%. Truman had wa waffled back and forth on the new Jewish immigrants into Palestine, now Israel, and had pushed forward a number of very left-wing domestic policy efforts. Think the New Deal. The most famous was his version of Medicaid, just one of many dead dreams killed by Truman's opposing Republican Congress. His enemies portrayed him as too far left and too inexperienced for the job. But the nomination was far from settled. Three candidates hungered for their chance to take on the weekend's incumbent president, not named Roosevelt. Last year's candidate, Republican Tom Dewey, hopes to stand again. His New York governorship may lead him to the White House. Dewey had run for president twice before, first in 1940, only as a hard-charging district attorney. He was one of the early non-senators or governors to be a serious candidate for president, but he had been a mob buster in his native Manhattan, throwing the book at Lucky Luciano and being the first prosecutor to charge a mobster with something other than tax evasion. Think prostitution and paying for it. By his side was his assistant district attorney, Eunice Carter, the first black prosecutor in the U.S. with a close working relationship with Dewey. It was Carter who convinced Dewey to go after Luciano. Dewey's small hand-picked staff began its attack on the underworld by ferreting out secret records and getting the frightened victims of the rackets to talk. After long months of hard, patient, dangerous work, Dewey had collected enough evidence to move in on the city's leading racketeers. Out of the 73 indictments he secured against key criminals, Dewey convicted all but one. Rackets, which had flourished with complete immunity, began breaking up as the city's gang overlords went off to jail. Dewey went on to be elected governor of New York, becoming an early trailblazer on civil rights. He even created a race-blind hiring application job process, which would later serve as the basis of anti-employment and hiring discrimination. In 1944, after his election, Dewey became the GOP's nominee to stop Roosevelt's unprecedented fourth term, getting 40% of the vote, the strongest challenge to Roosevelt yet. So 1948 has the genteel old-school waspy governor, Dewey, assume he'd have the nomination sewn up. And against a candidate who didn't project either gravitas or strength, Truman, unlike his predecessor. But then comes Minnesota Governor Harold Stassen, known then as the Boy Wonder. He was only 31 years old when he won election to the governor's office. Only a well-regarded state attorney, Stassen gave a keynote address to the state GOP convention, wowing everyone in attendance. It was essentially his talent alone that propelled him to the top spot at such a young age. Certain nomination is Republican Harold Stassen. A recent visitor to Britain and to Moscow, Stassen has come out openly against controls and socialism. Clearly, the kid was going places, and it helped that Stassen resigned his post as governor to serve honorably in World War II. Other politicians weren't young enough, but Stassen became the first candidate that served in World War II to run for president. He had a novel story to his name. Both men cut liberal bends, so Ohio Senator Robert Taft, known as Mr. Conservative or Mr. Republican, as well as a famous isolationist, was waiting in the wings. A staunch Republican, the bespectacled senator from Ohio was one of the few who voted for a cut in America's aid program for Europe. But the story of the day was the Red Scare and the supposed influence of the Communist Party in the wake of World War II. The House of Un-American Activities, or HUAC, concluded their famous Hollywood communist infiltration hearings the year before, often ruining the careers of actors and those involved in Hollywood simply for their own beliefs, many of which were dramatically overblown. <laughs> Washington sees the biggest free all-star show in years as the Committee on Un-American Activities hears testimonies from prominent Hollywood personalities. Among those who gave evidence was Robert Taylor. 
Robert Montgomery spoke in strong terms against totalitarianism in general. Screen veteran Adolf Mojo strikes a highly dramatic pose before giving his own very definite views. I believe that 95% of the people in California are decent, honest American citizens. The Communist Party is a minority, but a dangerous minority. It is completely uh, against the un-American feeling, this communistic thing. I believe I would, I would move to the state of Texas if it ever came here, because I think the Texans would kill them on sight. <laughs> the next step, prosecute the existence of the Communist Party. Before, people couldn't be charged for attending meetings of the party. Merely, they could be blacklisted or have their careers ruined. But now, many in the Republican Party were calling to outlaw the Communist Party altogether. You could go either way with taking a position on this issue. The nation was split on the Red Scare when asked if they supported the HUAC hearings by Gallup in 1948. 37% of Americans approved, 36% disapproved, and 20% not wanting to get involved, sounds familiar, had no opinion. Stassen, with his international governmental approach, didn't want to be seen as too liberal with the GOP base, so he decided he proposed a ban on the Communist Party while on the campaign trail. This caused him to garner the support of a young, up-and-coming, anti-communist crusading senator out of Wisconsin named Joseph McCarthy. McCarthy sent his political machine to help Stassen in the all-important Wisconsin primary. Back then, there were only six states that held primaries, but 1948 was the first year that those primaries really mattered. Candidates, for the first time, had to earn their place, at least a little, to win the nomination. General Douglas MacArthur, who wanted to be drafted from a groundswell of support, decided not to enter after a poor showing in the primaries. Truman's opponent may be one of his own army commanders, General Douglas MacArthur. Republicans favor him and believe that if he stood, he would be elected. Stassen beat Dewey in the Nebraska primary as well, signaling a sharp turn of momentum. Many in the press said it was the communist ban proposal that did it. But Dewey made a comeback in New Jersey while Robert Taft became a contender, winning big in his home state of Ohio. But the last primary was Oregon. And with Taft not on the ballot, he was hoping for Dewey to be knocked out once and for all, and Taft would have the opportunity to run forcefully against a more unknown, less nationally famous candidate, Harold Stassen. So with the entire GOP nomination hanging in the balance, the local media called for the first ever broadcasted presidential debate, centered around the topic, should the Communist Party be banned or not? And now, speaking for the affirmative, is the Honorable Harold E. Stassen of Minnesota. Chairman Van Boskirk, Your Excellency Governor Dewey, my fellow citizens, during the recent war, I saw many young Americans killed. I watched ships explode and burn, planes crash in flames, men, our men, my friends, fall. I met thousands of prisoners of war as they were liberated from indescribable conditions of imprisonment and suffering. I viewed the devastation of cities and of farms. In the midst of these experiences, I thought more deeply than ever before of the way in which men should live, of the preciousness of freedom, of the future of America. I made a quiet resolve to do everything within my power after VJ Day to keep America free and to prevent a third world war. Notice anything? Stassen was a consummate politician. Three minutes later, he still hasn't answered the question. But he was already winning the debate. Dewey, much like Ron DeSantis today, had a reputation of being stiff and not relatable. Stassen painted an emotional picture before getting to his position on a controversial topic. In flowery, beautiful language, he knew he had the more extreme view. So he was going to soften his audience up first. And notice in the next clip of this debate, how he quickly touches upon his position that jumps away from it as quickly as possible. The direct outlawing of the communist organizations in America and in the free countries and positive action in ideals and moral standards and justice on a worldwide basis. I've presented my optimism, my hope that such policies would lead to a future of peace and of progress for ourselves and for others without the tragedy of a third world war. Now notice the use of language. He says the Communist Party should be in a different league, that it shouldn't be actually classified as a party. 
What he's essentially doing is he's kind of othering to strengthen his point in the debate that generally joining a party is unconstitutional, but that because it's the Communist Party, it's not a normal political party. All of a sudden, the ramifications of the debate changes. You can think of that in society today, whether you're on the liberal side trying to defend trans people or going after Christian parents if you're on the liberal side, or if you're on the conservative side going after transgender people. Are they people or are they in a different category? If you're a conservative, same thing with Christian parents. Are you a parent or are you a parent trying to push your agenda? All of a sudden, the terms of the debate dramatically changes. Stassen was good at framing it that way. I consider it to be clear that these communist organizations are not really political parties. They are actually fifth columns. They are quizzling cliques. If we are to have the best chance of winning through for freedom without the horror of a third world war, the free countries must take action to protect themselves against this fifth column in this unsettled period which has been called a Cold War. I do not think it is generally realized in America that we do not now have any law to effectively oppose the actions of these communist organizations either overground or underground. There's now no law in America to prevent these communist organizations from secretly developing organizations of hidden members, from carrying on secret conspiracies to promote strikes, to stir up hatred between races and religions in America, and from following their directions from Moscow. And finally, the trick of saying his proposal isn't that big of a deal. And while opponents say the banning of a party is opposed to the First Amendment, Stassen notes how it is actually, in his opinion, constitutional. His approach wasn't to sound fiery in his rhetoric, but to minimize his view, thus making it seem more reasonable. Such a law would not outlaw ideas. It would not outlaw thoughts. It would make illegal, organized conspiracies of fifth columns. Such a law is constitutional under Article 4, Section 4 of the United States Constitution. The debate format had Stassen speak for a half hour and then Dewey for the second half. Dewey made sure to highlight what Stassen was brushing under the rug. He didn't use emotion, Dewey. He didn't tell a complicated side-tracking story. Thomas Dewey spoke directly and simply, and it seemed to work. Dewey was thought of to have a pretentious manner of speaking. So he let Stassen seem like the more pretentious one, while Dewey came off as more honest and direct, despite the fact that Stassen had considerably more flair. Issue is, shall we pass a law outlawing the Communist Party? Now, I suppose if you say let's outlaw the Communist Party and preserve our liberties, and if you say it fast enough and don't think, it seems to make sense. But my friends, it makes no sense. You cannot do both. And no nation in all the history of the world ever succeeded in doing it. See? Straight, simple, and to the point. Reviews had the audience enjoying Stassen's speaking style, but when it came to the issue at hand, they agreed with Dewey. They just couldn't keep up with Stassen's arguments and felt that Dewey did a better job leveling with them. Question before us is, shall the Communist Party be outlawed? The only way I know that could be done is to declare by law that people calling themselves communists would be denied a place on the ballot and that anyone who's a member of that party after the passage of the law should be tried, convicted, and sentenced to prison for a crime. I believe in keeping the Communist Party everlastingly out in the open so we can defeat it and all it stands for. Then Dewey hits at home citing recent history. He warns Americans not to make a martyr out of any politician. Sound familiar with all the prosecutions of Trump? That the more they are attacked and prosecuted by law enforcement, the more of a following they will actually have. It'll backfire. And it was the outlawing of the Communist Party, Dewey tactfully concludes, that led to Lenin overthrowing the Russian government in 1917, thus having the nation turn communist itself. The Tsars of Russia were the first people in the world to follow this idea of outlawing the Communist Party. They whipped them and they drove them to Siberia, they shot them, they outlawed them, and in the very year 1917, Lenin and Trotsky were exiles. And what was the result? 
this outlawing gave them such colossal following, such enormous force, such great loyalty on the part of the people that they were able to seize control of all Russia with its 180 million people. And the first nation to outlaw communism became the first communist nation. That's what I do not want to happen to the United States of America. Finally, there's an opportunity for a back and forth. Although each individual exchange would last for over five minutes, Stassen tried to get Dewey to agree with him that they both supported the Munt-Nixon bill. This bill, with a young, newly elected Richard Nixon as one of its sponsors, would require all Communist Party members to register in a national governmental database. Stassen uses this bill to soften his position deceptively. Is Stassen so wrong about his affirmative position? If both him and Dewey support this congressional bill, but Dewey doesn't fall for it and uses his opportunity to attack Stassen, albeit lightly. He brings Stassen's extremism back to the forefront of the discussion. He won't let Stassen water down his extreme position. I uh, gather from Mr. Stassen's statement that he has completely surrendered. The uh, Munt bill obviously does not outlaw the Communist Party. Mr. Stassen, in these words, has from Oregon to New Jersey and back again gone before audiences of the American people demanding in these words that the Communist, Par Communist Party be outlawed in the United States and in the other free nations of the world. The Munt Bill does not outlaw the Communist Party. The only authorities Mr. Stassen cites for the fact that for his claim that it does are the present head of the Communist Party and a former Communist. Whereas I point out very clearly that the author of the bill, Mr. Munt, the committee which sponsored it, both say in the official records of the Congress of the United States that the bill does not outlaw the Communist Party. Now, if Mr. Stassen says that that is all he wants, then he has completely surrendered because he admits that he didn't mean it when he's been demanding from one end of this country to the other that the Communist Party be outlawed, and he's willing to settle now when confronted with the facts for a law which the author and the committee say does not outlaw the party, which of course it doesn't. Forty million people tuned into the debate that night, almost a third of the nation's population. Press reviews and audience polls had Dewey generally winning the debate and it changed his image in the primary. In the week before the influential magazine, The Nation, said of Dewey, there is an element of tragedy in his collapse as a leading contender. He has pursued such a cautious course and had been so clearly motivated by ambition that he stands for nothing and has no real friends. Dewey was seen as too calculated and careful. This debate allowed him to have an image that he was actually more direct with the American people than the mainstream media was giving him credit for. After the debate, the big election day in Oregon loomed just four days away. Stassen sounded the alarm, blaming the Eastern Party establishment for trying to unite against him to knock him out of their race. Their stooge, Stassen implied, was the elite, rich, well-connected New York Governor Thomas Dewey. An unprecedented amount of newspaper advertising, billboards, radio time, paid campaign workers, and Eastern contacts have put on a tremendous campaign, Stassen told the New York Times. What he was trying to do was get ahead of his inevitable loss. Stassen campaigned hard in Oregon, but Dewey had two key tricks up his sleeve. The first was to paint Stassen as too liberal for the GOP, specifically on health care. Stassen supported a Medicaid-style plan that had been killed by Congress when President Truman supported it. So the Dewey campaign sent a telegram to every doctor in the state, signed by a former Stassen supporter, also a doctor. This doctor said he abandoned the boy wonder governor after coming out after the governor came out in support of, quote, socialized medicine. Back then, the candidates wouldn't call another socialist, but they would call their policies socialized. Not much has changed. And perhaps well-deserved, Dewey was ready to cash in on his support for civil rights. He registered over 10,000 black voters in the state of Oregon. While a small population, many had moved from the segregated South to seek a better life in the North, working on the shipyards on the Oregon coast during the war. After these black residents were registered, they were given flyers highlighting Dewey's pioneering 
of his race-blind hiring process for state government, the first of its kind. It later became the blueprint for anti-discrimination hiring laws. Most blacks in the 1940s and even 1950s were staunch Republicans, with ardent segregation supporters in the South comprised mainly of Democrats. The results? A close race as Stassen had early momentum pre-debate, but Dewey made a comeback victory with 52% of the vote to Stassen's 48%. Interestingly enough, Dewey won by 11,000 votes. In addition to his skilled debate performance, he had 10,000 African-American Oregonians who registered to vote to thank him for his victory. Dewey wins because of the black vote in Oregon. Oregon, out of all places. History might surprise you. Oregon marked the last primary, but wait, the battle for the GOP nomination is far from over. Back in 48, delegates at the convention largely had the power to decide on who the nominee was going to be. But Dewey won most delegates in the primary, locking down about 20% in all. Still, Stassen and Robert Taft, remember him, gained some delegates as well. Provide their own excitement and give Philadelphians a glimpse of convention razzmatazz. The convention convened in Philadelphia to a wild scene. Keep in mind, back in the day, conventions used to be a hell of a lot more fun than they are now. No one knew who the nominee was going to be, so each candidate brought all the pomp and circumstance along with them, and all their supporters to make a scene and generate attention for their campaign. Dark horses share post positions with the leading candidate. Who will be the nominee? Silk stocking candidate. Stassen seems to be tops just the same with this loyal supporter. But she's taking no chances on backing the wrong candidate. Now, since no one knew who the nominee was going to be, Robert Taft pushed hard to be the alternative to Thomas Dewey over Stassen. Taft accumulated goodwill by his party faithful by being a staunch isolationist. He opposed America's entry into World War II and spoke against Truman's Marshall Plan, which gave a massive amount of aid to war-torn nations in Europe. Taft essentially wanted America to mind its own business. The guy thought he had a shot and even brought a live elephant with him to the convention. A live elephant in the middle of downtown Philadelphia. The elephant signs the register and turns to the man many expect to be his master in 48. In Earl Warren, the governor of California, hoped to be the last minute compromise candidate. Warren was known as an economically liberal Republican, continuing Roosevelt's big government New Deal policies while spending big on public infrastructure, creating an early California blueprint for the interstate highway system. He later became a famous Supreme Court justice who ruled in favor of civil rights in the Brown versus Board of Education case of 1954, where public schools became integrated as a result. California comes Governor Earl Warren, hoping to become the compromise candidate of a deadlocked convention. Pretty daughters don't hurt his cause a bit. At this point, Dewey is getting nervous. Robert Taft comes out of his secret meeting with Stassen. Included in that meeting is a key Connecticut politician, potentially stealing Dewey's eastern base away from him. Senator Taft, you've just come down from an important meeting upstairs. I wonder if you'd tell us who the other participants in the meeting were. Uh, Mr. Governor Stassen of Minnesota, uh, Governor Duff of Pennsylvania, Governor Sigler of Michigan, and Mr. Harold Mitchell, the state chairman of Connecticut. Senator Taft hurries off to spread word of the meeting. And then things get fiery. Stassen accuses the GOP establishment of unfair, secretive tactics. Next out of the conference comes Harold Stassen, attacking Dewey tactics. What are these tactics that uh, you resent? Uh, the tactics of uh, false claims of the position of delegates and of uh, leaders in delegations, and the uh, reaching of uh, secret agreements without consultation with delegations, and then suddenly announcing them and... Uh, calling them atomic bombs when uh, this convention is a convention that should deliberate and not have bombs thrown at it. Then a key supporter of Stassen's takes things even further. He compares the tactics of the establishment GOP supporting Dewey to the bombing of London and other European cities in World War II. Not far off from when Chris Matthews called Bernie Sanders supporters brown shirts or when the mainstream media has compared Trump to Hitler. This radical language isn't anything new. This is the first time that I know of in the history of American politics when European blitz tactics have been used to affect the delegates. 
But Dewey had an ace up his sleeve. The Pennsylvania boss, who wasn't expected to support him, announces his endorsement. Off the convention floor, Dewey strategists, veterans of three conventions, round up votes. Warner Pathé News cameras exclusively record the first big Dewey bombshell as Pennsylvania's Senator Edward Martin agrees to give up his own favorite son candidacy to nominate New York's governor. Next day, convention time, the big day. Senator John Bricker gives a rousing speech in support of his friend Robert Taft. It brings the entire convention to their feet, signaling the dark horse conservative might just have the momentum he needs to win. Ohio Senator Bricker touches off the next outburst. To give to you for your vote in confidence of great service, my senior colleague in the Senate, the Honorable Robert A. Taft of Ohio. But it wasn't to be. Voting begins on the first ballot. It's four o'clock the next morning before the last demonstration is over. Seven candidates are nominated. It's all over now, but the voting. Nobody wins. Dewey gets 434 votes. Taft actually beats Stassen for second place with 224 votes, while Stassen nabs 157. Two more ballots proceeded, making this the last GOP convention to go beyond two ballots. Before the evening session opens, frantic conferences continue. What has happened during the recess? Senator Bricker provides the answer with a dramatic message from Senator Taft, conceding Dewey's victory, urging that it be made unanimous. The other candidates follow suit. Harold Stassen personally urges his supporters to follow the will of the convention. But on the third ballot, Dewey is nominated. And for his running mate, Dewey chose his former challenger, California Governor Oral Warren, cementing the liberal bend in direction of the GOP in 1948. With him to the rostrum come three of the six Warren children and his wife. The Husky vice presidential nominee says... I accept the nomination for the vice presidency of the United States. Now, the reason I'm so quick to say that is because I have not yet recovered my breath, let alone my thoughts. And if I let it go any longer, I'm afraid that I would even forget to say that. Uh, the Stop Dewey movement on Taft at Stassen's part didn't work because, well, neither candidate wanted to be the one to step aside. Sounds familiar as Trump battles his primary challengers. Dewey gleefully arrives to accept the nomination. Mr. Dewey, called from his hotel to accept the nomination, hurries to convention hall where he is greeted with a wild ovation. The parade lasts half an hour. The ideals of the American people are the ideals of the Republican Party. We have tonight, and in these days which preceded us in Philadelphia, lighted a beacon in this cradle of our own independence as a great America. We've lighted a beacon to give eternal hope that men may live in liberty with human dignity and before God and loving him stand erect and free. The Republican Party chooses its candidate for the world's biggest job. After that, well, there are a million YouTube videos about the 1948 general election. I'm the primary guy. Suffice to say, it's a close race, with Truman surprisingly pulling off a surprise victory, even after a famous newspaper declared that Dewey defeats Truman. Senator Barkley and I will win this election and make these Republicans like it. Don't you forget that. Well, that's what he said when he was nominated as Democratic champion. And here he is casting his own vote after his terrific campaign. Dewey voting. He, like most Americans, had been pretty certain that he was going to be the next president. The campaign had been a quiet one, but worldwide interest was naturally aroused when election returns indicated that the Democrats and Truman were winning. When a Truman victory was assured, Dewey broadcast this unqualified concession of defeat. I've sent the following wire to President Truman. My heartiest congratulations to you on your election and every good wish for a successful administration. I urge all Americans to unite behind you in support of every effort to keep our nation strong and free and to establish peace in the world. 
the result certainly astonished everyone, except Harry Truman himself. Afterwards, Dewey decides to quit politics post-election, concluding life largely as a forgotten figure, even though he was one of the first politicians to be aggressive on civil rights, even though he significantly limited the power of the mafia nationwide, even though he spoke out in favor of free speech by not banning the Communist Party, thus getting the public to agree that arresting someone for their First Amendment right would be a most dangerous, slippery slope. Dewey went on to become an elder statesman in the GOP, helping, the, helping secure the nomination for his moderate friend Dwight Eisenhower four years later. He died in his early 70s after a heart attack while he was going golfy, golfing with his family on a warm, sunny day. As for Robert Taft, he had run for the nomination before in 1940 and 1944 and would go on to run again in 1952, becoming the strongest challenger to Dwight Eisenhower. He died in 1953, ahead of the curve on the conservative direction of the GOP. And Stassen, he ran again in 1952, then again in 1964, then 68, 76, 1980, 1984, 88, and finally for the last time in 1992, before passing away at the age of 94. People who stayed active in what they believed in, I think, are those in all of history that had the the greatest impact. Family members say Stassen's interest in politics was strong until the very end. To make this world a little better place. Minnesota citizens. In January, he attended the State of the State address of Governor Jesse Ventura, who today released this statement. As Minnesotans, we can be proud of a statesman who never gave up his fight for a better state, a better country, and a peaceful world. Harold Stassen isn't the most famous Minnesota politician, but to many, he was the most powerful. You just kind of feel that Stassen will live on and on. And um, I know that all of the work that he has done will certainly do that. He was a less serious candidate than Eisenhower in Taft in 1952, but was still taken seriously in that campaign. That was the last time. He developed a friendship with Eisenhower and became a key advisor in his cabinet. Stassen helped establish the creation and ground rules for both the United Nations and for NATO. So if you're a liberal, you could say Stassen's early involvement with the creation of the UN helped aid human rights around the world. Or if you're conservative, then he was a globalist monster who was a key figure in globally controlled secret Illuminati-like government. See? It's all about how you spin it, which is why this election, specifically this primary, tells us so much about modern political thought and behavior, for better or for worse. But it all began in 1948.